Hey Jonathan, uh, thanks a lot for the for the amazing amazing talk. I was like uh, <laughs> quite like uh, amazed by all the most of most of the questions I had prepared you already answered. So I'm just going because I I mean I thought what I could ask and so on, but you, somehow you already like answered. But you should keep the discussion going on. Uh, maybe it's the Saturday effect that you said to me in, offline uh, about Saturday. We don't have question here, but uh, I have my own uh, my own questions. Uh, in general, I want to speak uh, so far the, the the talks that I had. I had to introduce a topic of innovative biomedics, which is one of the, the the core topic of the channel. But you made my life easier, so I'm going to start with that. You you. Uh, uh, Essentially, I would like to, because I have two channels. One, another one is about the web application, web development. It has to do with my second postdoc. For my second postdoc, I, I was working with a web application for target therapy. So I developed a web application that could show all the target of the of your system biology like simulation. Uh, uh, so maybe that I can uh, somehow mixture the two public, the one for web application, the one from biomathematics. Can you talk a little bit more about this uh, this challenge of because you did a very nice like he exactly what I'm, I think like I, I'm uh, like in my head a web application is quite friendly. People can put the simulation. Can you talk a little bit more about this challenge of building this uh, this web application? Maybe give a little a little bit more thought about this difficulty and so on. Sure. Um, well, let's see. Where should I start? I mean, I think the web application that we're building for modeling, from a technical perspective, there's not much that's that's perhaps really unique about them from other web applications. So we were able to use the same web development technology that, that other people do for lots of other purposes. So Date Manor, for example, is built using React, which is developed by Facebook, yeah. and that's one of maybe- I use Angular. <laughs> so, uh, right, so we use Angular for different projects. <laughs> um, so we use both. And those are you know, two of the most popular frameworks for for reactive development today. But uh, in the case of, of React, because people say, I mean, I, I, I guess it's not you, I guess you have a team that work for you, that is working with you and so on. Uh, React was able to do, because React has some kind of, uh, they say that uh, some people claim that React is a little bit immature, in the sense that uh, you can build fast, but have difficulty to go on later. Uh, it has been easier for you too, because you build the application, but I thought you were trying to increase the application, you're trying to make the application each time better. Uh, did you face some difficulty with React, or it's just a legend? It's not true that React is, is difficult to to make it bigger later. Um, uh, so we, we have used React and we have used Angular in, in two different projects. And uh, I think it's fair to say that the Angular, the project that we're using Angular, it, it is substantially more complicated. And, and Angular has facilitated the, the size of that. So I think if, if you compare the two, React, I think, is definitely easier to get started. It's definitely more flexible. Um, uh, but, um, one key, key thing, I think, which is not so much the fact that like one is a less comprehensive framework than the other, um, Angular is, is type, right? Angular uses TypeScript and it's so it's perfect. typed. Yeah. Um, that typing, I think, provides a huge advantage for the development of large applications just matching types and then the errors that you get when types aren't matched, yeah. that avoids a lot of need for for otherwise ha for having to write a lot of unit tests. Oh, well, unit tests, you have to talk about that yeah. as well. <laughs> uh, I mean, you still need unit tests, but um, it's really amazing. If you look at like React, like I think it was, it's hard to get React to work well without a lot of unit tests. In contrast, um, our experience is that with with Angular, I mean, it's hard to get by with zero, but um, 
but you need a lot less because you can rely on the, the typing and the type checking much more. Yes, but uh, just uh, because, uh, let's say, uh, when I start my postdoc, I, I was given the chance to build the application. So I did a very strong research about Angular, React, and so on, so on, Vue, all the kind of possibility. Uh, uh, what, uh, one thing that people used to say that uh, Angular would be very uh, nice for you to go on later because you had about the talk about the test and so on but in the case of specific of the uh, react uh which kind of it i mean i i know that the technical detail maybe it's not that maybe i don't know don't have to talk about technical details more detail but which kind of library are you using for the unity test integration test i'm not from the react community but he, maybe they want to hear as well because you are using so maybe they want more what about the unit test, integration test, and so on? Um, for React, we use uh, Jest and Cypress. Jest, so we okay. use Jest for unit tests, and we use Cypress for end-to-end -end tests. Perfect. <laughs> and um, I, don't know, I mean, there's other choices. I, I, I don't know that. I mean, Jest, I think, was, we found is pretty easy to use. Um, I mean, Cypress is powerful, but also kind of a pain to use. Uh, my, yeah, it, yeah. you know, I mean, if I was giving advice to people are looking for advice, I would, I would strongly recommend like if you can't, because dealing running end to end yet test is much more touchy, because um, when you run end to end tests, um, the the testing framework is the way that Cypress works. The testing framework is much more isolated from your code, so you don't have the ability to actually inspect the uh, your code the same way that you do. You're testing at like a arm's length, and so you have much more obtuse ability to actually test something. So, for example, okay, you run a test with Cypress. The only thing that you can do is you inspect the result in HTML. You don't have the ability to directly test the output of a specific function, and so if you want to test anything, you have to like query your HTML doc, result in HTML document. You have to wait until that the browser has rendered this. So the testing it is a lot more complicated. If you can, where possible, I would you know, encourage people to think about how do you refactor your code so that you can, instead of trying to test it for intent testing, test it with unit testing with something like Jest. So just factor so, all the logic so that you don't need to do end-to-end -end testing. Just out, out, out of curiosity, so you're talking about testing. Are you, are you using test driven development or behavior driven development? Are you using kind of methodology to develop based on testing or just, you just make the test after the application is, is, is read or you make a methodology like TDD, BDD, DDD, all this kind of thing? Like test driven development? Right. Yeah, we, um, so, well, we're, so for, for this, the last project that I mentioned, um, which it's this really integrated set of projects that we call uh, biosimilars and, and biosimulations. So there, we're continuously releasing uh, additional code as we as we go along, and, and so we're simultaneously adding more tests and and, and releasing. I, I don't know that I would. I don't think we we really use like a strict test driven development philosophy. Um, but I think it's, it's fair to say that we certainly do have tests integrated into the development. It's not like we build the application and then we write tests. We're constantly going back and forth between... So it's TDD. So I use TDD, test driven development. <laughs> yeah, but I, it's not, we don't, at least in, in our own group, we don't... False. I wouldn't say we, we follow a very strict test driven development paradigm. Okay, but so so uh, some people I have I have seen recently several talks from web web developers. So I, so do you agree that test is very important because today have two kind of developers: people that don't, don't like test, people that like test. Some of them like they shoot each other, like as always. Uh, in your case, do you think that the test 
uh, even the, because in order to, to create tests, it's extra work. You have to do extra work to make the test, to, and so on. Your code sometimes three times bigger than the conventional code. So specifically in your case, uh, the test is a, is a kind of, is a good trade-off. You are like, it's a pain off so to make the test. Um, well, I mean, I guess the first thing I would say in, in my own experience is that it's just very difficult to get things correct without any testing. And especially if you have an application that you're, you're anticipating will be complex enough that you're going to develop it over a long period of time, or maybe there will be many people involved, perhaps the, the exact goals or the approach will, will change over time. If any of those are going to be true, then I, I think it's going to be important to have a, at least some amount of, of tests. Um, the next thing I would say is that, you know, there, there are a lot of different reasons why people do computation and there are a lot of reasons why people build software. And some software is simple and some software is inherently more complicated. So let's say that you're developing a web application, which is just going to be like a straightforward display of data that's in a relational database. And in that case, you know, you, you might have some code, but the code might be pretty close to almost being a declarative application. In contrast, consider like the development of a simulation algorithm for a mathematical simulation. In that case, there may be a complicated algorithm that you have to encode into software. And so in, in one case, I think you may be able to get away with a very small to, to close to no amount of testing, especially if you use um, something that's heavily typed or some framework, which has some built-in validation and linting. Uh, in contrast, if you're going to develop um, scientific algorithms, I, I think in that case, it's probably going to be di very difficult to escape the need for unit testing. In integration, then in so, end to end, and so on. So, you know, I, I think like whether or not you need tests, it depends a lot on what you're trying to do. Like, I think you always need tests, but I think the more complicated things that you build, uh, the less graphical that they are, the less clear what the answer even should be, the more you're going to need tests. Just one curiosity, how will you, you end up doing like, a, because in general, when I see people working with system biology, biomathematics, bioinformatics, it's not very common to find someone like you, like you showed a very strong uh, movement between uh, system biology, web application. I think that's the future. I mean, you should always think about to make web applications, so on and so on. How was this? this I, I don't, it was like a metro or you, 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 in one state of your life, you decide like, I need to start a bigger application because that's important or that was not like natural, just like uh, naturally you change from one side to the other. This like changing because you like, like a complete like soccer player. You, you, you do the model, you do the web application, people can interact with your application. How that happen? Um, well, I mean, just me, me personally, um, I mean, I've just, you know, personally been interested and in, I've built software, um, over you know, many years and me, I guess, you know, being of a sort of newer generation, I've never really built much desktop software. So if I speak to older people in, in my field, or I look at simulation tools, which were built earlier in, in history, they all emphasized desktop interfaces. Today, I think if you look at a lot of people that are starting new software projects, right? So I have the advantage of coming later in history. So if, if you're asking, you know, partly why web and not say desktop, you know, that's, I think just, uh, a function of the fact that browsers have gotten better and there's more interest in general in, in web deployment. 
you said, you said, you said about uh, React on the, on the back end, because right now I'm reading a book about deep learning and Node.js. Node.js is my, is the, I, I, like, I like to program in Node.js. Uh, do you have any experience with this head calculation? What are you using the back end? Java, Node.js, what's in the back end? So, yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, that's something that I wanted to mention. So you're, you're asking about this intersection between web development and, and modeling. And, you know, so part of the answer to your question is, is just me, me personally, I have been involved in building web application or, you know, what, what we've kind of come to know as web application for a long time. And so it's just something that I am familiar with. And so for me, translating back and forth is not, is not a problem. Um, that said, of course, most scientists are not familiar with web development, software engineering in general, and, and certainly not web development. And so if you want to run a scientific team, which is doing that, then I think someone in the team, some, like someone has to have the vision that whatever gets built needs to be web accessible to make it accessible to the broader scientific community. But, um, you know, another dimension of your question is how, how do we actually do the, the computation? And so in, in our field, um, in systems biology, which is a little different than the machine learning, the community is smaller. And in our field, there's very little packages that are available in Node. So we do not really do any meaningful scientific computation um, in JavaScript or in TypeScript. The way that, um, so for the Datenator project, for example, like all the all the data integration, all the data normalization, that's actually all done in Python. And then what we do is we deposit it, all the integrated normalized data into um, a Mongo database. Then the web application that you see, this this just like pulls the data and displays it, but but that's relatively simple. The complicated logic is all done as like a pre-processing step before you even get to the database. And then in the, the other project where we're using Angular, for example, where we're running simulations, in that case, all the logic is really encapsulated into the simulation logic. It's all encapsulated into Docker images. And inside the Docker images, we're generally running Python or C. Um, in fact, there's no example yet um, where we're running JavaScript or you know, more specifically inside of a Docker image to, to execute simulations. So, um, so to your, so the way that we, we basically make, make this work is that all the logic for simulations is hidden behind APIs, REST APIs. And those REST APIs are behind the scenes, either directly running Python or for simulation, they're orchestrating the execution of Docker images, which are further hiding, uh, encapsulating even more logic. It seems that the, your solution was the same. I, I faced the same problem. When I was doing my, my second postdoc, I faced the same problems. It seems that your solution was the same. I didn't know, I, I thought to myself, how am I gonna do? So the solution I found was like yours. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the Galax was run in a, in a server, put the data available in MongoDB, MongoDB show the data in the front end. But uh, uh, do you believe that maybe in the future, when someone start to make uh, Node.js, because deep learning is one of the most difficult problems. So someone from Google wrote a book, a very nice book, that he said that the JavaScript was made for deep learning. If deep learning is very powerful, uh, JavaScript is powerful enough to, help, to learn deep learning, I believe maybe it's just a matter of time until someone starts to build this, this package uh, using uh, JavaScript, because Node.js is JavaScript somehow. So maybe I think just a matter of time when you start, when you start to have a very powerful system biology like package uh, using JavaScript. Do you think that the, there is some technical problem or it's a matter of availability? Um, 
I mean, for the things that we work on, I think there's a few issues. Um, so for so for the the this project, uh, biosimulators and and the related work that we call biosimulation. So in the, in that case, um, one what we're one thing we're trying to do is we're we're trying to take all these simulation tools which have been developed, which can be used for different types of simulation and standardize them to, to make them more reusable and, and composable. So in that case, um, what we're doing is we're, we're taking advantage of simulation tools that have been created, some of which were, were initiated 20 plus years ago. And in that case, none of those are implemented using um, JavaScript. I mean, perhaps they could be today, but they were all developed and modelers made other uh, other choices. And so we're simply looking at that and, and observing that other people have chosen universally not to use um, JavaScript and Node. And so we just have to somehow embrace the decisions that they've made. And what we see is that to the extent that the community is aligning on a single language, uh, that language is Python, not uh, not JavaScript. Yeah. I mean, the other thing I would say is for that particular um, application, um, this is targeted at built uh, at composing simulations together to construct what will inevitably be more computationally expensive simulations. And so I don't know that there'll be any reasonably near future in which it will be which will be um, in which you'll really want to be able to run this in your own browser. So like you can forget about like this they separate these questions of whether you're going to use Python or C or Java or or JavaScript to, to um, implement something versus where are you going to run it? So in my opinion, like if your goal is to run something in a browser, then and then of course like you need to figure out some way of translating most of the logic into um, JavaScript. But if you're going to run it on some remote server, then uh, I think you don't need to necessarily implement it using uh, JavaScript. You want it implemented in whatever way allows developers to develop it as quickly as, as possible. And I think in our field, at least, I would say it's, it's substantially easier to try and build stuff in Python or, or maybe C++ because the underlying libraries that you need, um, there are many underlying libraries available to help you in Python. In contrast, in Node, there's, there's just very little to work with. Yep, I think that's a, maybe still not a, a problem I faced with Java anyway. Uh, that's, a, that's a very uh, long question. I, I still want the same topic of innovative biomathematics. I would like to ask you a question because you are very close to the industry. So very close to the industry. You are in the science and the industry. Maybe specifically from the United States. Uh, yesterday I was talking to a friend of mine, Carolina, and she and we were discussing about uh, the difference between the industry and the scientific world. Uh, how they should, I don't know, it's in the United States is different because in Brazil there's a huge gap between the industry and the academia. But I think they need each other. The one example is the web application. Web application is a way to make available to the public something that was developed in the in the scientific world. Can you talk a little bit about the, how it works in, in the United States or so other countries that had experience about the the communication between science and the industry, the challenge that you face? Because it seems very it seems very like easily moving between the industry and the academia. Well, uh, I mean, I, I guess I can I can see that perspective and, and where you, you might think of this as being close to industry um, in the sense that there's software being developed. Um, but at the same time, we, we don't have any collaborations with industry. We don't have any funding from industry. So in, in that sense, I we don't really have much 
um, connection with industry. And I think there is a, a substantial gap between computational systems, biology and models and, and industry. There's, uh, I mean, I, I, I think there is a fair amount of use of flux balance analysis models by specific elements of industry. Um, but, and there's certainly some uh, use of modeling in uh, pharmacology, but I think more generally, there's, there's also still a lot of skepticism about the value of these systems models when in many cases they, they don't make particularly accurate predictions. So I think what a lot of industry is, is looking for is just still a substantial improvement in the predictive capabilities of models. And until that point, I think the embrace of models will, will still continue to be relatively low and they'll continue to be a relatively big gap. So it seems that you are still very, uh, we as a, as, a, as a scientific community, we're still very far away to have a model that's going to be really used by someone. It seems that we're still very skeptical, as you said, about the, yeah. the validity of this model. It seems that there's a web application at the moment they are more like an academia like uh, stuff. Uh, I still not being used by the industry, I guess, as you said. I, I think where there is, and perhaps this is what, part of what you're, you're reflecting on, is there's a lot of shared skills. So the the kind of you know skills that are necessary to do this work are in high demand among industry, um, but people are using them in the industry for slightly different purposes and so that's that is kind of what I think creates this sort of feeling like there's a connection or close connection with industry even though industry is not actually using these kind of models um, but so that that like that does have interesting consequences though um, so you know one consequence of that is that this kind of work might might actually be quite good preparation for uh, for work in industry. So, for example, like your your typical computational biologist um, has probably never heard of testing, but in order to build a large model or large software application to support modeling, you, you probably need to learn about testing and continuous integration and code management and so on. And those things, I those skills i think are, are much more heavily prioritized by industry than academic science um, the other thing that we see in the united states is as a result of that um, uh, and that, that there's also a big salary gap between academic science and, and industry which is probably true of most of the world um, it's uh, it's not that but the gap is in favor of the industry or in favor of the academia? Uh, academia is, is um, industry is pay is, is much more favorable. And so that, that um, can make it difficult to find enough people in academia with the skills that are needed to do this kind of work. Okay. Uh, I would like to maybe to close the discussion with two questions from social network. I have uh, one from LinkedIn. LinkedIn, uh, I student from a PhD student from mathematical biology. He asked me the following question, but he, I'm one. I um, you already answered that, but he, I, just to, to summarize. So he said, like, I, I'm in the first year. Uh, of my mathematical biology, study, mathematical biology study. I'm a little bit lost. Could you please give me some advice by what should I start and which are the skills that he, I must learn? He, he's talking about the, the skills that you need to start to be a good mathematical biologist. Uh, you, you, already said, you already said something about that. Can you maybe summarize the best skills that someone must have if they want to work with math, mathematical biology? Well, I mean, the first thing I, I would um, I would respond and, and, and you know and point out is that mathematical biology is a very broad field, um, and so I don't want to overgeneralize about what skills are, are needed 
know, the, the skills that are needed for different areas, I think, can can be quite different. So, for example, um, if you wanted to work in genome informatics, in that case, there's a lot of established methodology, there's a lot of established software tools, and, and so a lot of people focus quite a lot of time on, on learning how to use very specific established methods and tools, and there's a lot of emphasis there on assembling those established tools into workflows. In contrast, in, um, in computational modeling of, like, of dynamical systems, the kind that I described, I would consider this a comparatively less mature field. And in that case, I think there aren't so many software tools or established methods that someone should really prioritize trying to learn. And in, in that case, I think instead, it's a really important to try to develop more foundational skills in computation. And it's, uh, I, I don't mean to, to suggest that the computation is necessarily the most important skill to learn. I, my experience, it's a frequent set of skills that many, um, many early graduate students, many postdocs just have not developed because I think a lot of schools, a lot of programs in and around computational biology, they focus a lot on development of physical concepts, mathematical concepts, but not so much on and, and the basic introduction to, to computer programming, but they don't focus a lot on how to build complex computational systems. And and in contrast, the practical work of doing computational biology, especially in an immature area, involves a lot of data management, software management. And so what I see, what I've seen is a lot of people, I think, start to get stuck or they start to work their work becomes extremely inefficient because they haven't been taught how to more systematically or rigorously deal with complex computational systems. Um, so that's that's why I emphasize particularly for more immature fields that I think it's important to really build a strong foundation and how to write um, high quality code quickly. And I think for a lot of beginners, unit testing, and, and also if you're working in, in uh, highly complex mathematical codes, I think <laughs> learning how to do unit testing and, and can continuous integration is probably some of the most essential practical skills that you could learn and relatively simple. Okay, but would you say, because you, you said it very nice, that there is a, a kind of problem, problem in the education system, that they focus too much on the mathematics. Do, uh, MIT is very, I saw that you had a very, you, I think that you did your PhD by, by right in the MIT. And the MIT is very famous because they're always trying to think. In your case, MIT was helpful in this, that sense to you, or you believe that they also need needed to change a little bit how to handle this kind of situation? Um, so, right, so I was an undergraduate student at MIT and, and I was a graduate student at, at Stanford and, um, I, and I took a lot of courses um, at, at both institutions. And, um, I, you know, I can tell you in, in my experience, you know, first of all, it was several years ago, so um, it's possible that the curriculum has changed, though I, I don't think it has. Um, undergraduate students, uh, even at those institutions, and graduate students, uh, generally will not be exposed to to things like unit testing, continuous integration, uh, even most students working in computational science. The As an undergraduate student, so the only students who are really exposed to there's only really like one course as an undergrad student at MIT that, that really exposes people to things like unit testing. And it's a software engineering lab. And that's, it's really only software engineering students that take it, or computer science students more specifically that, that take it. Generally, 
I mean, maybe some students that are earning multiple majors will take it, but um, in, like students like myself who are interested in like computational physics, computational biology, bioinformatics generally don't take that course. They would usually take courses in like computational systems biology, algorithms, data structures, but they don't usually take the, these lab classes because the lab classes are a huge amount of work. <laughs> so Even the folk, like, in my experience was that, um, you know, at MIT, there are certainly pe people who will take like six, seven classes more or more semester, but it's very unusual that somebody is going to take more than one lab class uh, because the lab class is just a huge time sink. Yeah. <laughs> Ernest was smart. He didn't take class. He was take the note of somebody else. <laughs> So, so what I've seen, and, the, and the, and also if I talk to my, I have a number of friends from college who are software engineers, I mean, even the ones that, that took the software engineering class, I mean, they, they'll largely tell you that they didn't learn how to test code through that class anyway. They really learned on the job after they graduated or maybe during internships during college. In um, case as well. And so that's, that's really how I learned about all of this. Um, there was a brief period of time. One, one of the most uh, informative periods for me was that there was a brief period of time where as a graduate student, I worked with a guy who had previously worked at Google and, and then, but more immediately he had worked at a different um, FinTech startup company. And, and so I really learned from him really on the job. I didn't learn all of this through coursework. And even retrospectively, knowing what the concepts are, now I can confidently say that they're basically, aside from this one software engineering class, there are no classes that, that I could have taken uh, which would have introduced this. And at Mount Sinai, for example, um, we actually do have a course which introduces this, but very few students take it. Okay. And I think that that course is relatively unique. I mean, we, we do offer it here, but not many schools offer something similar to that. Yeah, that's yeah, interesting. So I think it's just, it's a topic which is quite important to the practice of science, of of, uh, well, of complex computational systems, which arises both in software engineering and in computational science. And it's something which is, is typically learned um, on the job. And, and you know, one thing to, to keep in mind is most of the faculty who are teaching courses, they don't know about this topic. So of course they're not teaching it. <laughs> the yeah. people who know about it don't work in academia. The people who know about these things, they work in industry. So you are saying that the people who say that they, uh, who knows? Uh, is doing. Who does not know is teaching. We do we everywhere ever that. <laughs> well, I think it's it's more that um, you know academia and, and industry they they focus on different problems, and so the problems that people are working on in industry they have driven the development of a certain skill set, and academia by virtue of working on different things. Um, it doesn't necessarily foster the same skills to the same degree, even though on the surface, there's a lot of similarity between academic research and, and you know, particular aspects of engineering. Okay, Jonathan, I just want to ask a last question. Is this one is from the t Twitter. Uh, that, uh, one of the that participated on Twitter, he asked, what, what is needed for one to be called a biomathematician? If you want to call someone a biomathematician, what is needed to be called? I, I don't know the answer, do you? <laughs> because I mean, there, there's no like uh, certification, there's no formal <laughs> definition of what a, a biomathematician is. Um, I, I, I mean, I guess one thing I could say is I think the the lines around biomathematics, the lines around computational biology, bioinformatics, these are very blurry lines. Systems biology also, these are, these are kind of uh, gray areas, I think, 
you know, anybody who, who combines some math and computation with biology could potentially consider themselves uh, a computational biologist or, or a mathematical biologist. But do you think that's something bad or that's something good? Because do you think that we should like uh, define better the boundaries or it's be better to live the way it is? Like uh, let, let people do whatever they want and call themselves by mathematician, like uh, or system biologist or whatever. Um, I mean, for the most part, I, I think, I don't feel like there's, there's a strong need to have labels. Uh, I think that different scientific problems re require different skills and i think I feel like the key thing is that whatever scientific problem that you're interested in that you should figure out what skills are essential for that problem and try to go develop those skills and maybe they'll be computational maybe they'll be mathematical maybe they'll be you know neither uh, of the above i i think where the lack of definitions is a little bit problematic is um, the, so in, in systems biology and then another, you know, aspects of biomathematics, computational biology, there are these aspirations to, to have like really big models of, of, of biological systems. And to the degree that that requires collaboration and that that in turn is probably going to require concentrated funding on a few specific problems. I think that this this community side of like coalescing people around individual problems or individual projects, that I think is challenging when there's no clear definition of what the field is. Um, and, and so without a, a clear definitions, like the field is very diffusely scattered across a large number of questions. And, and so that means many people are, are simultaneously in investigating different things. And so from a certain perspective, that's good, but it also does mean that it's, I think, difficult to assemble a large team of people around any one really big problem. Yeah. And I so agree. that is to some extent at the, perhaps the detriment of large scale science. Thank you. So, John, thanks a lot. That was an amazing talk. Yeah, I could go on for hours, but I don't, I don't want to take more of your time. And uh, you are also invited to come back in the future to bring a new topic. I think that's one of one of the best talk, one of the best live, because I, I already knew that because I saw your talk previously uh, in Como Lake, and I know how nice it is. So I would like to thank everyone for participating. Uh, you have all the information of John in the description of the video. If you want to leave a, if you want to leave an email, he can leave me out in the description of the video. So Jonathan, thanks a lot, and uh, we'll keep in touch. Yeah, thanks so much for organizing this. Did you like the content of this channel? So, please subscribe to the channel. It's quite simple. You just have to hit subscribe and you, have, you can decide which level of the notification you want. You may choose all the notifications, which means that everything that I do, you receive a notification on your, on your bell here, on the upper corner, or you can choose no notification. I would strongly recommend you to subscribe, even if you don't want to receive all the notifications. Just hit here, no notification or hit the one that you like the most. It's pretty important that you subscribe to the channel so I, I can achieve a high, number, a high number of subscribers and people can as well understand that this channel has a nice content to offer. And YouTube will understand as well that it can make a nice divulgation of the channel. So please subscribe to the channel. Hey guys, I am I'm passing here very uh, briefly, very fast. I just want to let you know that now you have a, a second option. I said before I have already created a Patreon, so you can help the channel if you want. 
But I have so decided to create a Buy Me a Coffee, which was a platform that I have found recently. I have done some research that the, the biggest difference between Buy Me a Coffee and Patreon. I, the, the biggest difference that uh, buy me a coffee is a one-way donation. It's, uh, it's mean that you give a, like a donation. That's all. That it's just one time. Uh, that can that can be a very nice option. For for instance, that you see a video on this channel, or you see an article, anything that you see that you may find useful for free. Uh, then you just uh, buy me a coffee. <laughs>